Greetings. Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here in Stockholm, and I'd like to thank all of the people from DOC for this really stimulating conference. I've been really enjoying all of the talks I've attended, and I also want to thank Kay for being really supportive and helping to organise coming here. Um, I'm going to begin my presentation today with a narrative, a story, um, and this is my topic. So please sit back and enjoy a story. Arriving into the yoga studio just before 8am, something of a struggle to leave my family so early on Saturday morning, I placed my mat inconspicuously near the back of the studio. Introducing myself quietly to the teacher, a small, mature man, I reply to his gentle question, have you been attending lead classes in Ashtanga? Nodding. But I can't help myself adding. I have a background in Iyengar yoga. I'm still learning the Ashtanga series though. This is my first Mysore ex experience. Ah, he replies. <clears throat> Do you know Serena Mascara A and B? Yes, I reply. And I'm okay with the standing series, but I get a little lost in the primary series on the floor. I also admit to knee troubles when he asks about my health. Returning to my mat, discreetly observing the people in the studio around me, I recognise a few people from the new classes I usually attend. The early morning light seeps through skylights, opening the space of the warm studio, populated by yogis of all shapes and sizes. So, beginning with simple preparing, bringing my attention to my alignment, deepening my breath, reaching arms up, exhaling, ujjayi breath audible, finding a rhythm with those around me, flowing through sequence movements, and into trikonasana, a welcome flood of familiarity as I deepen into the pose. Across the room, I hear the teacher instruct another student. Lengthen the underside of your ribcage. And I automatically shift my attention from my knee to this activity, finding a little more length and consequently a little more rotation and opening. Feeling that lovely sense of suspension in the pose. I simply breathe, heart opening, feet grounded, finding my own expression in subtle moving. I feel the teacher's eyes on me as I inhale coming out of the pose, reposition my feet and exhale into Trikonasana on the other side. Standing next to me, he instructs, <coughs> Karen, in Ashtanga Yoga, we take the first two fingers of our hand around the big toe. Ah, thank you, I reply shifting my hand from the floor to my toes, grateful to learn the right way, and a little embarrassed not knowing this, and then wondering why, although I don't ask him. I was loving my trikonasana, and now it feels slightly different. Breathing, observing. What is the benefit of this change? Is this only an aesthetic difference? Is it style or tradition? Hmm. Well, two rather than three contact points on the floor, it's a bit harder to balance. Moving behind me with a light touch on my shoulder blade and a gentle grasp on my forearm, he draws my torso slightly backwards in the space, adjusting me. What's the new challenge for me here? How is this different? Breathing into the subtle shifts. Awareness deepening. And so I'm reminded that this is yoga. Moving, breathing, observing, recognizing habit, making choices, being responsive, welcoming the eventual suspension of judgment, tension, moving as one. Okay, before I return to the specifics of talking about research and teaching and learning in yoga and dance, I want to just briefly situate my research within feminism and phenomenology. And I'd like to out outline 
uh, how I articulate embodied ways of knowing and sort of make a very brief comment <coughs> on the somatic awareness and contemporary dance. But I'm going to do this really briefly. <coughs> you can ask after if you like. So first of all, I work from a feminist and phenomenological perspective, and uh, that means that I'm particularly interested in researching dancers' lived experiences. I'm interested in challenging the notion of knowledge as a singular Western form and instead validating multiple knowledges. I'm really interested in multiple ways of knowing, and particularly our dancerly ways of knowing, which I describe as embodied ways of knowing. And here are some of the methods that um, I use in my research. I did say brief. <laughs> um, I have a particular understanding of embodiment, perhaps something that we share, in, although we may use different words, um, and it's holistic rather than talking about a relationship between body and mind. It's a holistic notion in which recognition of difference is really important. Embodiment is really specific, it's not arbitrary, it's fleshy and it's fluid, it's not fixed. Further, I articulate embodied ways of knowing as an epistemological strategy, in which each person's specific embodiment is explicitly important in how they experience the world. Embodied ways of knowing are developed from experiencing knowledge as constructed, as contextual and as embodied and arise in the lived experience of combining different ideas through experimentation. It arises in dancing, it arises in living our lives. However, I think it's important to... Um, <coughs> I'll just, I'll just go on, actually. Um, just to comment very briefly, um, for me, that uh, dancing and practicing yoga and other somatic practices potentially assist in cultivating a somatic mode of attention what we might call body listening, to acknowledge that my colleagues uh, work here. And this is integral to embodied ways of knowing. These are modes of awareness, responsiveness and understanding that privilege sensory first person embodied experience. And these experiences are of course of oneself but also of, in the way that we engage with others and the way we engage with the world. However, the ways we attend to and with our bodies and even the possibility of this attending is neither arbitrary nor biologically determined, but culturally constituted. So it's important to think that while in many cultures a somatic mode of attention remains present in everyday life, in Western cultures, arguably, some of these practices have been quite neglected. And one of the things that has happened in our world is the introduction of somatic practices within uh, Western dance education over the last 25 years, perhaps 30. And yes, Eva, we're yet to see whether these practices will remain. Um, but certainly for me, I think my dance training as a professional started maybe 18 years ago, and somatic practices were part of that um, during that time. So, recognising embodied knowing and aiming to cultivate a somatic mode of attention in dance has led me, and of course many others, probably many of you I think, to critique traditional teacher-led instructional dance pedagogy. And for me this has meant moving towards a critical feminist and transformative approach to teaching and learning in dance. I am continually engaged in this investigation of the relationships between teacher and student, particularly in uh, deconstructing power relations and um, trying to remove the guru apprentice or the choreographer, um, novice dancer or um, choreographer dancer hire. I draw on Sherry Shapiro here because for me I recognise that the intent of the learning experience moves from one of learning movement vocabulary for the sake of creating dance to gaining an understanding of the self, others and the larger world for the possibility of change. In relation to this research then, I've been asking the question, what teaching and learning approaches can I adapt to effectively and meaningfully integrate yoga practice into dance classes so that students can become response able, able to respond? 
reflecting on my experiences as a learner, putting myself um, back into the position of a learner by going to a different type of yoga practice, I appreciate that I um, that each vinyasa and asana that I have learned has been developed through a complex learning process resulting in what you could call an embodied schema from which I draw. So initially I learned asana and Iyengar yoga by observing the detailed demonstrations of the expert teacher at the front of the class and now we know this process, right? Um, <clears throat> copying and practicing the movements as best I could responding to instructions myself and to the adjustments the teacher did to my body, um, making use of props and to support alignment and balance, sometimes reluctantly, as advised by the teacher, uh, focusing on breathing. So this is a teaching method quite similar to general motor skill learning and quite common in dance. Over years of practicing yoga though, I, I'm pleased to say that my awareness has deepened and I um, feel I've moved towards a more responsive and integrated understanding of embodied knowing through yoga. So in contrast, I started by telling you about my experiences going to a Mysore ex um, class or practice. And this practice actually requires the student to already know what I wrote, the vinyasa and asana sequences, to be, to be moving towards autonomous practice so that they can focus on breath and subtle adjustments suggestions from the teacher. Few, if any, demonstrations are given. And hopefully, the student is aware and open to the possibility of embodied knowing. While I think this practice is interesting for me as someone who's been doing yoga for a long time, yes, <laughs> um, and it allows me some sense of autonomy and a more flowing, perhaps arguably, more dance-like, continuous experience I'm convinced actually that another method of teaching and learning is more useful in my tertiary education classes. But I do respect the cultural traditions from which yoga comes and the very, very long history. So there's immediately a tension here for me in introducing or integrating yoga into my own practice and contemporary dance. <coughs> so I would like to pause now to make a, a point that's really important to me and that is about how significant it is to me as an educator that the teachers I, uh, the students I work with are very diverse. They're culturally diverse, they are male and female, there are always men in my classes. Um, <coughs> while they're usually 18 to 30 in their age, there are always mature students as well. And they come from de very different movement backgrounds and dance experience. Few have encountered yoga or other somatic practices before. And their embodiment and their embodied ways of knowing are often sophisticated but radically different from each other. They're not a homogenous group of students. And that's to do with the fact that I don't teach on a dance program, although I teach dance. <coughs> In my experience, however, these really diverse students usually appear really open to learning sun salutations, some standing poses in the work that I integrate into into floor exercises. They enjoy mastering the sequence and they seem to recognise the value of yoga and dance for strength, flexibility, etc. and alignment. And of course in this they reflect the common perceptions in the research that people have about the benefits of yoga. However, I'm also aware that some of these students would say exactly the same thing about being involved in dance, that it helps with their strength and their flexibility and their alignment and provides a sense of relaxation or stress relief. So I want to draw a couple comments out of um, uh, discussion transcripts to share with you to show you what some of my students have said. Now, I've just got a couple examples here. So Melanie's a second year student and she decided um, to add uh, cl yoga classes to her dance training. And she makes uh, a fairly obvious comment that she recognises uh, balance and flexibility are real benefits for her, but she also comments about mental and what she calls somatic balance. So she sees benefits for health and well-being that transfer into other aspects of her life. So as well as talking to current students, uh, and admittedly the students who I talked to were the especially keen ones who came to additional classes with me where I was developing this work. 
Um, I also offered these classes to the wider community, which included some graduates um, and uh, semi-professional dancers. So Emma here, who um, uh, she comments that she used to just launch into or tackle dance, tackle learning things, and now she's come to appreciate later um, some value in the relaxation, in the quiet, and in the stillness. And Patty comments that uh, while it keeps her strong and injury free, she also uh, experiences unlocking and processing memories. So she's identifying some psychological, emotional health benefits as well as the obvious things. However, I've also observed in my classes with current students over the last 10 years that many are frustrated by what they perceive as stillness held poses and making shapes. Um, they're not necessarily terribly interested in breathing and paying attention and, and um, reflection. And their notion of well-being is often about being injury-free. And again, this is not a dance program. I'm talking about students who are theatre students and law students and sports students and every other type of student that I'm teaching. Thus, um, I'm interested in opening up the possibility of a more reflective, contemplative engagement in cultivating embodied ways of knowing within dance, even though I recognise that an awareness of other benefits in this type of um, deep practice might not develop until much later on in their lives. So all I can do at this point is sort of introduce and hope that over time uh, a deeper practice might grow. Thus I desire a somatic approach to teaching and learning yoga integrated in dance that seeds or cultivates the possibility of embodied knowing. So I want to move now to share a second story with you um, in which I offer some of my teaching experiences and observations of students in the classes that I'm developing. Um, in doing this, I acknowledge the profound work of Sandra Frale, whose scholarship and practice has influenced me in many ways. This is ongoing research, and so I look forward to some discussion with you after this story. There's just a little bit about method here that I don't want to talk about, but please ask later. <coughs> okay. Entering the dance studio, the room is warm filled with bustling students, rearranging layers of clothes, conversing and laughing, bursting into hip-hop improvisations and energetic activity. Sensing that they are not ready for contemporary dance floor exercises, I respond immediately by changing my class plan. I invite them all to make a circle. Welcome everyone, let's begin our warm-up today with sun salutations. I will move with you, but I invite you to see what you remember and what you can uh, remember together as a class. Bringing my toes together, breathing deeply as I raise my arms, I trust, diving towards the floor, that they will remember. <laughs> Peripheral glimpses inform me that at least some are remembering, and as the class moves together through the basic yoga vinyasa, others are following their neighbours when they don't remember. As we continue, the students begin sharing prompts with enthusiasm. My students are very talkative. <laughs> <laughs> Knee over ankle, someone calls, remembering some of my basic cues. And stepping forward, calls another student, perhaps impatient to come out of downward dog. <laughs> and slowly the energy of the class shifts. Quietly stepping out myself to observe the group continuing. I notice some students rounded backs and downward dog. And in their next repetition, I prompt them, let's stay a few breaths here. What happens if you rise on your toes? <coughs> As you lower your heels again, consider the length of your back and front body. By the time the group reaches their last repetition, I add in quietly, what happens if you coordinate your breath with your movement now. Allow it to flow. So now perhaps the group are ready for more contemporary dance. 
addressing the group as we walk easily through the room, I ask if any of the students can remember any of the elements of the first or the second warm-up exercise. As they volunteer their recollections, I clarify that the aim of the warm-up is to progress from where we are right now as adults walking in the world down backwards through our developmental movement stages until we curl up on the floor and have a short relaxation. Relaxation is my favourite part, one student volunteers happily. Verbally reconstructing the movement exercise together, some students offering demonstrations themselves as they recall walking and standing, folding transitions to hanging, patting on hands and feet, curling up, uh, sorry, kneeling and crawling into sitting, turning, sliding onto bellies, and curling up, and then lying in relaxation. After a short relaxation and some focus on breath, I lead into contemporary dance exercises on the floor. I move with the students again, moving with rather than demonstrating before, reducing my words as they learn and as they remember the pattern. Adding music, I encourage them to improvise, take, take more time in a stretch if they wish, create their own transitions between familiar movements. And eventually I suggest they will move to standing using a spiral pathway. As we continue walking into the room, I pause, providing time for them to investigate parallel and then turn out, and then yoga standing alignments, prompting observations of the differences in rotation in the hip socket and what feels most familiar and unfamiliar. And so our time together in the dance studio continues. So, in closing, I think um, this is my response to the provocation that I feel we've all been given here to think about how, um, to think about teaching and learning and dance and how we work with students for the future. I wish to set up the conditions for learning dance and yoga to seed and to cultivate the possibility for embodied ways of knowing. Thank you. And now, questions? I'm interested also because I teach yoga in my, my, <laughs> my department and um, I've also found some students that have taken yoga classes that they have not benefited from the yoga classes and there has also been a lot of talk, especially last spring, uh, about yoga that it has actually caused people to injure themselves and also uh, some of the very traditional forms of yoga that it actually has led to object on the body rather than... <laughs> Yes. rather than having this somatic approach which you talk about. Absolutely. And then also with the traditional kids, very male, male orientated as a female student sometimes having even sexual abuse or forcing facts like this in the yoga communities. This is very interesting. Um, I can't comment on some of the more extreme examples you give, but certainly um, I think while I can see some really strong benefits, and particularly as a feminist, some opportunities for women to engage in yoga as a practice of renegotiating their relationship with their body, it's not always the case. Yeah. And my real concern, particularly with the Stunga practice, and my apologies to any Stunga practitioners here, <laughs> um, is that coming to it from a Nyinga base, I wonder how a new person actually um, manages to practice safely in that context, especially walking into a Mysore class. So there isn't a huge amount of detail given, and um, I've tried very discreetly to observe other students while also trying to have a good yoga experience <laughs> um, to see what happens when they don't know what's going on. And I experienced that myself. I got to maybe Jan Janishasana on the floor, which I was unable to do on both sides, and started watching, and I, I knew I was lost. I knew I shouldn't be doing this on this leg anyway, um, and I, I, you know, I wondered if a student gets to a point where they're really lost, they're trying something they haven't done before, how are they safe in this context? 
Um, and of course, within the West, there are usually lead classes, and this is one I could just have you attended the lead classes first. But I have some concerns. I have concerns even within an Ayinga approach too, even though it's a very step-by-step -step method for us um, who don't live our lives cross-led and close to the ground yeah. where the cultural <laughs> practice comes from. Yeah. Interesting. I just wonder if, if um, I don't know, it's just a question. Could the same thing be said of um, a grand class mm. or a ballet class? Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, and sport and, and all of those things, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, how long have you been um, doing this with your students? Could you say that the, uh, the colouring of the inner awareness that uh, obviously occurs in yogic practice has coloured the way of dancing in uh, another sense than other techniques? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I guess because I do love yoga, uh, I've been teaching every group of students sun salutations for 10 years. Yeah. Um, and then the ones who stay for more and more classes with me will do more. So some of the graduates that I talked about are from 2003, 2005. Mm. Um, it, I feel, well firstly it's very hard to know whether it's dance itself that's, that, and the practices in dance that are really helping this deep awareness or whether, or to how much yoga specifically has mm. contributed. But I certainly think it has and I have noticed a shift in their attitude towards yoga which I think reflects a shift in this and their willingness to go into a deeper awareness of the truth. Is that mm. Yeah, question? and also probably the this yogic uh, relational side of it, the relation to the body and your mind together, is also creating another relation to your own dance somehow, I, I think. And yes, which, and I which, I... which probably will make it change. Yes, and mm. I think this is why why we work with somatic practices in dance, because mm. we see this benefit. But my concern is uh, always to keep present the engagement with others and the engagement with the world. So um, mm. just as a little wee example, I, I'll take more senior students, in fact I'll probably take every class outside, and we do select to the sun outside and we figure out where the sun rises mm. and sets and we track the passage east in the southern hemisphere, east, north, <laughs> west, through through the world. So we start to think about our somatic practice in, in mm -hmm. engagement. Yeah. Okay, and the last question, that's Lena. Do you see any differences in, for example, a Tai Chi practice <coughs> that still believes a bit in the movement aspects slightly differently? Would there be any, any differences for you in, in that? Um, I've only done a little Tai Chi. I've probably read more than I've done about Tai Chi. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I, yeah, I, perhaps I'm not really in a position to really comment comparatively, but again, I guess the idea is, well, the recognition for me is that it comes again from a very different, uh, in both cases, yoga and Tai Chi come from a, a foreign mm. culture um, for pretty much most of my students. Um, and so there's a process of perspective shifting to participate in the first place. Um, does, perhaps that's something for a Tai Chi practitioner to comment more deeply on, sorry. Yeah, I can say.